Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight at the Thunder Bay Museum. My name is Scott Bradley. I'm the executive director of the Thunder Bay Museum. But um, again, thank you all for being here. This lecture is presented in support of the traveling exhibit, End of 1948, I Came to Canada, The Holocaust in Six Days. This is, comes to us from the Montreal Holocaust Museum and was developed with funding from the government of Canada. I would like to begin tonight by acknowledging the original custodians of this land, pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and future, and where they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and the hopes of indigenous peoples. We also recognize that we are meeting on the traditional land of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850, and to acknowledge the role of the Métis settlement in the development of our community. A bit of housekeeping tonight. Um, we are appreciative of everyone wearing their masks in the building. Um, there is a bathroom on this floor just outside of the door um, on your way to the elevator, and there are additional ones down on the second floor should you need them. Um, there are refreshments tonight, so feel free um, at the, uh, at the, after the uh, event concludes to partake. And, uh, and there will be time at the end of this presentation for questions and answers. And so for those of you joining us online, please do use the Q&A function and the chat function to ask those questions, and we'll be able to, and we'll uh, feed those to Mr. Sharp at the end. So uh, I would like to uh, welcome to the podium uh, Mr. Mark Sharp. He is the child of Holocaust survivors and is a retired lawyer living in Southern Ontario. And we are so grateful to have him here tonight to share his experiences and knowledge. And so thank you and welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Scott. And uh, thank you folks for showing up. You wonder what is a guy from Southern Ontario doing in Thunder Bay? Uh, well, I can blame my daughter for that, Deborah Sharp, who is uh, a professor at uh, Lakehead. However, uh, despite what I just said, I am pleased to be here. It's always uh, something that uh, I appreciate doing by conveying a little bit of history. History is very important to me. History is important to a lot of people, and I hope that a little bit of history that we're going to discuss tonight is going to be of assistance or important to you uh, folks. As indicated, I am the child of Holocaust survivors. Many of you may think about survivors as people who somehow survived the concentration camps. Luckily for my parents, they were never in a concentration camp. They ended up uh, in situations where they could uh, use the assistance of their Gentile neighbors in Poland to help them survive. Starting with my father, my father was born in 1913 in that part of Poland which was known as Galicia. Uh, it's also important to note that Poland was uh, an independent state for the first time between World War I and World War II. Before then, historically, it had been overrun by various uh, combative neighboring states. Their borders constantly changed. At one time, it was affiliated uh, as a joint state with Lithuania. All of that's very interesting, but it was the first time that Poland was an independent state with defined borders uh, was between the two wars. As I said, my father was born in 1913. In 1914, when World War I broke out, um, his eldest brother, and he was the youngest of eight living on a farm. His eldest brother was um, uh, forced to join the Austro-Hungarian army. The Austro-Hungarian Empire at that time included, as many of you may know, uh, countries like Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, uh, Austria. Uh, so it wasn't a matter of simply being uh, loyal to one particular state, it was being in theory, loyal to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had been very liberal to Jews in Poland, much more so than previous um, uh, reigns of various kings. My father lived, uh, as was born in Galicia. Uh, he, Galicia was, uh, at that time, the southeastern part of Poland. Today, the area that we're going to be talking about is part of Ukraine. And I'm sure most of you here, or all of you, 
will have some idea now about Ukrainians' uh, war with, with uh, the Russians and its borders. You may have heard a lot about a city called Lvov in the western part of Ukraine. And where my parents both were born, in the general area was in an area known as uh, the city, the major city there was Zlochev, where my mother was born. Zlochev uh, is now and was then still in the western part of um, Ukraine. Well, then it wasn't Ukraine, it was Poland. Um, and uh, Zlochev was some 60 kilometers east of Lvov, or now it's known as Lviv, but it was uh, uh, known as Lvov at that time. The exact place where my parents, my father lived, was known as Maidan Penyansky. Maidan is Ukrainian for village, and so it was village Penyansky. It was largely a farming village, uh, and my uh, father, um, as I said, was born and raised on that farm. It was a successful farm that had cattle, horses, um, they had a dairy operation, they grew crops, um, and uh, his father, Mordechai, after whom I am named, was quite highly regarded in the community. He always uh, gave everybody a fair shake when he bought or sold a horse or a cow. He was highly uh, respected. So life was good on the farm. When my father turned 20, he was conscripted into the Polish army and was um, obliged to be part of what was known as the Phantom Regiment that was stationed in Zlotyr. He enjoyed, or did well as a soldier, he enjoyed soldiering. He loved being outdoors, he loved the rough and tumble of the army, and he was an expert marksman. And being an expert marksman gave him a lot of privileges, which meant that he could largely come and go when he wanted, and he had an in with his sergeant who made sure that he didn't pull KP duty, because if he didn't pull KP duty, he said he would not take part in shooting competitions. So he had a lot of control that way, until he found out that he would not be able to be part of or take part in officer training because he was a Jew. At that point, he realized it, if he didn't really, if it didn't really hit him over the head earlier, that although he was obliged to fight and die for Poland, if it came to that, but he would never be more than a second-class citizen. He thought at one time about going to what was then to become Israel and uh, went so far as to go to the authorities in what was known as the history to get papers to be able to go. He got those papers, but his parents begged him not to go. They said, you might be bitten by a, a viper when you're draining a swamp, you might get malaria, all of that things that can happen to you. And plus someone had to look after the farm because at this point, his brothers and sisters had all left and got married and had children, and uh, he was largely the one that with his father ran the farm. So he stayed. I take some time to mention this because had he not stayed and had he gone, the likelihood is strong that some 55 people that he helped to save would not have been alive. And I'll come to that uh, momentarily. So he's in the army, and um, he then is discharged in, uh, early on the mid mid thirties, but has to do reserve duty every year of some weeks. He maintains that. In August of 23, 1939, August 23, 1939, rather, the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was signed. I suspect some of you may be aware of that pact, uh, some of you may not. It was a pact, a joint non-aggression pact signed between Poland, and pardon me, between Germany and Russia. And at the same time, the pact provided not only for non-aggression against each other, but how to split up Poland. And the part that the Russians would get in under the Ribbentrop uh, Molotov Pact was one of the 
one of the parts of Poland, namely Galicia, was to go to the Russians. The Russians also got the Baltic states, Latvia, East Estonia, Lithuania, and there were some other states that the, the Russians would get once war was started. And the Russians knew, and the Germans knew, that there would be a war. This is now less than one week, or close to one week before September 1st, 1939, when in fact the Germans attacked Poland. At the same time, a week or two thereafter, the Russians attacked Poland from the east and took over control of the area that my, both my parents were living in, namely Galicia. Both uh, parents have told me over the years that life under the Russians wasn't that bad. They were left alone. Uh, they could continue. My parents, uh, my father could continue running the farm. And uh, my mother and her family, which I'll come to, continued with life as it had been before. In, on June 22, 1941, the Germans launched Operation Barbarossa, which was an attack on Russia. And the Germans obviously broke the non-aggression pact, and they took over that part of Galicia that both my parents uh, lived in and started killing Jews. They had something known as the Sonderkommando, uh, which were units of SS that uh, rounded up Jews and slaughtered them. There were, there were great pogroms, largely in this, uh, around the Slochik area, where in one day some 3,000 Jews were killed just in one day. There were a lot of small communities nearby that, that uh, the Jews uh, were totally uh, annihilated from. This became something that um, was going to continue, and uh, my father wasn't sure what to do. Would he stay on the farm? Uh, should he uh, uh, leave, try to uh, save as many people as he could of his family, of which he felt responsible? At one point, um, he was obliged to, along with a lot of Jews that were still alive and that were healthy, uh, to work for a number of weeks in a coal mine in the area. He, uh, very early on, realized that he had to do something. And he said to himself, I'm not thinking like a soldier. And he determined that because he knew how to build bunkers and live, in, live rough in the woods, that he would try to encourage the rest of his family to do that. At the same time, he felt that he needed a weapon. He needed something to protect himself and his family. He had a Gentile friend who had a rifle. He went to this friend and asked that he be given this rifle and some ammunition. And he was uh, uh, able to get that. And I'll come to this shortly and, and uh, tell you a little bit about that. But in any event, he got this rifle, he got some ammunition, he uh, then went to his family and said, we have to move into the woods, we have to hide. At this point, his mother is some 70 years old, and of course, not someone who is going to be used, to, not going to be uh, able to comfortably live in the woods, in the cold, in the snow, in the all weather, uh, and uh, rough it. What he did was he encouraged uh, his brothers to go and look with him for a place in the woods where they could build a bunker. The bunker was designed along the Polish army lines, largely underground, but not totally underground. They um, took weeks to dig this bunker. It was 20 by 30 feet. And they created a roof out of uh, logs, covered the logs with pine boughs and earth. Uh, to make it somewhat waterproof. And they managed to obtain uh, large numbers of, of uh, supplies, uh, half a ton of potatoes at one point, uh, and brought in uh, equipment that they could use to help them survive, and uh, cooking pots, uh, some even a, a dairy creamer. So they were set up in this particular bunker. And ultimately, he managed to convince uh, 
his brothers and sisters and their families, at this point we're talking about 40 people, to come and stay in this bunker. They could only cook at night so that the smoke wouldn't be seen from the uh, uh, cooking fires. And at night, my father and his brothers would often walk back into the village and buy food. The village villagers knew that they were in the woods. They didn't know exactly where they were. This was a, a matter of trekking some 10 miles from the bunker to the village, loading big 100 pound sacks of food, carrying your rifle, and walking 10 miles back and all at night, 20 miles back and forth. At one point, uh, this, this had gone on for a number of weeks. At one point, um, a uh, number of looters, Ukrainian looters, uh, came to the bunker during the daytime and started yelling, uh, Jews, come out. My father at this point was asleep, having worked all night, but his brother Oscar was awake and took the rifle and shot when shot dead one of the looters, at which point so six or seven of them grabbed the body of the dead person and ran away. Totally surprised the Jews actually had a weapon. But my father and his family realized that there was no point staying in that bunker uh, because now the, there would be repercussions from the family and friends of the fellow that was shot. So they ran away and they ran to another bunker that my father's um, uh, brother-in-law who married one of his sisters had dug again at my father's urging. And at this point, it, that bunker was nothing more than a big hole. It wasn't really much of anything. And again, that was all the shelter they could have. They had some place to at least hide. So they went there. The bunker that they had built, they, they left behind a lot of material and food, of course. They couldn't carry everything when they were fleeing. But it got even worse. It got rougher. As time went on, there were a number of bunkers that they had to build because they were constantly being found out. In the last more or less bunker that they were in, they were in the front lines of combat between the Russians and the Germans. We're now talking 1942, 43, and uh, it was scary because they wouldn't know who was going to attack them, whether it was the Ukrainian nationals who were in that area, whether it was the Poles who were there to try to rob them, whether it was the Russians, whether it was the Germans. The one, at one point, the Russians had advanced to that area and a Russian major who was, happened to be a Jew, showed up on a horse with his company. And he was surprised to see them there in the woods in the middle of nowhere and took uh, a liking, not so much a liking, felt an obligation rather, to look after them, to help them. And he protected them from the Russian soldiers and he gave them passes to go through the Russian lines so that they could go and continue to buy food from their village neighbors and friends. And these village neighbors that I'm talking about were Gentiles that my father grew up with. They were like brothers. They drank together. They partied together. Uh, so they were very close and at great risk to themselves because the Germans had indicated that anybody that was harboring Jews was, uh, was liable to the death penalty, that their family would be wiped out. And you th if you think about it, that's pretty uh, much of a disincentive to help anybody if you're found looking after that person and your family is at risk. Nevertheless, they did that. I am talking now very generally 
I should point out at this uh, stage that um, my father, unlike many Holocaust survivors, talked a lot about his experiences during the war. He was not embarrassed about what he did. He was actually proud of what he did. And it was, it was not an everyday conversation, but it was quite often to the point where I, as a child, just assumed it was part of the background that everybody had that kind of experience. So when one year went in one year and out the other, and it was just part of the background. At some point uh, after I was married, my father uh, said, you know, I want to record this and uh, his experience. And we bought him a tape recorder and he spoke into the recorder. And my wife, Joanne, who is here, uh, typed up uh, by way of notes of what he said. And these were, these conversations were not um, logically progressive. They jumped around and it took a bit of doing at, later on by me to put them in some kind of order. The problem was that when the notes were made initially, they were a, a thin outline of what he went through. And the plan was that once we had this outline, we would go into greater detail about things that he said. So if he said something that was a paragraph in length, you could turn that into a chapter, literally. Uh, there were a lot of names of people that he mentioned that were Polish names that I couldn't spell, I couldn't even mention uh, say them, but at some point it was, just, I was, it was my intention that at some point I would sit down with him and clarify this and he would put a memoir together for the rest of the family. It was only for the family that he wanted to have uh, records made. He, had, he didn't have any broader ambition to uh, publicize uh, his uh, uh, story. But fate intervenes. And what happened was I got busy, I had a lazy streak, and while we took our time about getting back to it, he developed Alzheimer's. So nothing came of it at that time. The notes got lost. And after uh, both my parents died, my sister found the notes. And I, had some time in my hands. At that point, I was retired. I put together a memoir. Uh, and what I basically did was use his words, his language, and I tried to put what he said in uh, context of time so that uh, what he said happened in 1939 wouldn't end up showing up at the end of the story in 1945. So there was a bit of maneuvering on my part and putting together his story. And I went to uh, a client of mine who was a publisher. And I said, I need 50 copies of this memoir for my family, largely cousins, uh, children, grandchildren. And uh, my publisher friend started laughing. He said, I can't do 50 copies. For the smallest copies I can run off, number, the smallest number of copies I can run off are 200. So I said, well, that's the smallest, that's the smallest. So he, he printed 200. And I started giving them away to family, of course. And then every now and then someone would ask me about my father and I would give them a copy. Um, we have seven here today. I don't want any arm wrestling between people here. <laughs> the fight for them, they're, they're for free. They will tell you the story better than I can tell you. I don't know how we're going to do this. But uh, there are seven, and hopefully we can work out some arrangement. Anyway, when the Russians came, as I said, um, they were largely free. And my father was approached by the Russians. Um, they wanted men to help the army that was moving through. And they asked him what his skill was, what trade he had. And he other than being a farmer, he didn't have any particular trade, but he knew enough to say that he was a butcher. Because if he was a butcher, and he had butchered animals in the forest to survive, if he was a butcher, he could get his hands on some food. And so uh, he did, he was very successful in setting up 
a um, mess hall for the Russian troops in Zlochev. And he was assigned a, an NKVD unit. The NKVD, as you may know, is the, is the Russian uh, secret police um, to go and uh, seize animals, cattle, pigs, goats, whatever, uh, for this mess hall. And he was successful at that. And whenever a farmer said, you can't do this, this is my property, you can't take it, he would say, talk to this guy with the Tommy gun, which was the NKVD. So that's how the Russians fed their troops. Anyway, um, he did very well looking after this mess hall, and he um, was uh, someone who the commanding general actually called for whenever there was some issue about how they could uh, best feed the, the soldiers in the area. And, and that gave him a lot of power and a lot of uh, flexibility uh, to do what he had to do because there was an order from this general permitting him to follow through on any action that he was obliged to take. Fortunately as well, some of that meat ended up with his family and by this point, my mother and her family were in the same area as uh, my father and his family. They became an item, and he made sure that her family also got a lot of the meat. And that's how they survived until they were more able to look after themselves. My parents married in January of 1945. Nine months later, I surfaced. And uh, I surfaced in a German DP camp, a displaced persons camp. I was the first child of both extended families, my mother and father, uh, born after the end of World War II. Uh, and that, uh, the downside of that is I was spoiled rotten by everybody. Uh, because a lot of people died, a lot of this, not, not a lot, but a number of this, uh, immediate family were killed by the Germans, um, but here was a young, here was a baby who was going to represent life, continuation of life. On the whole, um, he saved largely 55 people, not just family, but there were people running around in the woods, barely clothed, had no place to go, no shelter, no food, and they were taken in when they came across the bunker. Um, and when my wife and I were married in Toronto, one of the survivors came and said, this man saved my life. It wasn't a family member, it was one of the people that they saved uh, who learned of them living in the forest in this bunker. I can go on about my father, I'll talk a little bit about my mother's experience. The, um, as, I, as I may have mentioned, my mother was born in Zlochev. Her father was a horse dealer. In fact, he sold, he was obliged to, by contract, to find horses for the Polish army. He did very well. Um, he was also in World War I on the side of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I have a picture of him somewhere riding, sitting on a horse holding a, holding a sword. They did uh, well, as I said. Um, they lived in a compound of large, two large homes. It was a large extended family. My father had a number of brothers, and they had a large family. But uh, it became evident once the Germans um, undertook Operation Barbarossa, that being a Jew in that part of the world uh, was uh, uh, not something that uh, was a good thing. I can go into a considerable amount of detail about uh, how they managed to survive, but the larger picture is that um, my father, my, sorry, my grandfather had a, a Ukrainian farmer friend that he did business with who told him, if you ever need a place to hide, come to me. And so they came to him 
and they were obliged to stay in somewhat of a hole under a floor that had uh, hay, hay piles. So they were living over this, under this hay pile. And um, they could only come out at night. There was very little food, even for the farmer. They got about a bowl of, of watery soup a day. They um, were skin and bones. There were incidents where their lives were at risk and by the skin of their teeth, they managed to survive. One that comes to mind is that when they were before the war, living in Zlochev, they had a big St. Bernard dog. And when they ran away to this farmer, the dog followed them. At one point, the Germans came with dogs searching for Jews. And the St. Bernard was there and started barking at the German shepherd dogs. And the Germans controlling the dogs thought that their dogs were barking because of the uh, St. Bernard. And so, but it was really because they also smelled that there were Jews here in this barn, but they didn't follow through. So they left. So how's that for an escape due to the, your family pet? The uh, living conditions, of course, were difficult. You, all you had for sanitary conditions was a pail that everybody had to use. My aunt tells me that um, they were so full of bugs and lice that the only way they could clean themselves was with kerosene. They washed their hair with kerosene to kill the lice. And ultimately, when they're Russians came through that part of the world and liberated the Jews. My aunt, Ella, who was the youngest of the three sisters, my, my mother had two sisters, my mother was the oldest of the three, um, had typhoid and she was on the verge of death. Um, and she overheard some Russian soldiers saying that not to treat her because she was going to die at any moment but to treat the others. Having heard that, she determined in her mind that she was going to live. And through sheer willpower, she did. Ultimately, um, they got together with my father's family, as I've mentioned, and they all decided that they would try to make it to a DP camp in Germany <coughs> under, that was uh, under American control. They knew that it was the best way to get out of Poland. And um, that's, as I said, where I was born. My mother, in fact, was nine months pregnant, walking from the Prague, from Prague, where they had stopped on their way out, and told me she talked about climbing over the uh, remnants of a bridge that had been blown up, holding on to girders. Uh, so she wouldn't fall into the river. Someone who at that time was nine months pregnant. It was a couple of weeks later that I was in fact born. My father, uh, they stayed, my, my parents stayed in that DP camp for a while, but my father decided he would go back to Poland. He was a bit of an entrepreneur and he knew that he could make a go of things. Everybody was going west, he was going east. All the members of both families thought he was crazy. Uh, and that wasn't the first time they thought that. But anyway, he went back to Poland, ended up in a place called Bielsko, which is on the southern border of uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, southern border of Poland and Czechoslovakia, a very pretty area in the mountains, and uh, ran a very successful restaurant business and other related businesses. He had a finger in a lot of pies. But when the Polish government became uh, communist, and at the same time there were more pogroms there, because times were difficult, so he had to blame somebody, blame the Jews. Um, he said enough was enough, and uh, decided that uh, they would move to Israel, which we all did. 
And I say we all, my father, my mother, and I, my sister Esther, was born in Israel. And we lived in Israel from 1950 to 1953. And uh, at that time, you have to remember that people were living on a beach in tents. There was no, there was very little housing. There was very little um, activity for people in terms of uh, jobs or income. Uh, but my father, through, with the assistance of his brother, managed to obtain what's known as a moshav. He was part of a collective farm, not a kibbutz, but a farm where farmers had their own property to look after, and they would pool their resources. And I remember as a kid running around in bare feet, I don't even know if I had shoes at that time, in, in this moshav that was across the road from an orange orchard. And I remember going into the orchard to pick oranges, and I saw trenches full of empty gun cartridges. And we would play with that stuff. Anyway, um, it was tough to live at that time in Israel. And uh, my mother urged my father to leave because she wanted an education for her children and to make something of the family rather than having to struggle daily to just to survive. And uh, we ended up in Canada in 1953. And my father always was grateful as am I, for ending up in Canada. He had a number of businesses, and uh, as I say in the book, you can always uh, tell a farmer uh, from his interests, uh, you can never wipe out the farm background from him, and he always longed to have a farm, despite having a business in Toronto. And he came across a lovely farm that had a river running through it, a 200-acre farm, he didn't have a pot to pee in. He had to put a third mortgage on the house. He drove my mother crazy uh, so that he could afford to buy this farm. And he did. And um, it's another story altogether. In any event, the family thrived. Uh, as mentioned, I, uh, I, I became a lawyer. My sister became a pharmacist. Uh, my two daughters both have PhDs. I'm the dummy in the family, uh, but in any event, I think he did well. I think my mother did well, and we are happy to be Canadians. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I'm, I just skipped along very quickly. If there are any particular questions, I'm happy to answer them. I see a hand up there. We hear so much about Holocaust deniers. Do you have thoughts about where on earth that comes from and how it can be addressed? Well, uh, if I knew the answer to those two things, I'd be doing very well. Um, I think there's some psychologists in this audience that could probably <laughs> answer that better than I, but um, the truth hurts. You know, if you uh, if you tell somebody that his people are evil and they did these nasty things, there's a there, there's an element in society who want to deny that. So you're lying. It's 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 fake news to a lot of people, and uh, the crazies on the fringe will publicize that, make a point of it. Um, General Eisenhower, who was the supreme commander of the Allied forces in World War II, when they entered the concentration camps, knew instinctively that that would happen. So he made it a point to order the, um, his people, his army personnel, to record exactly what went on in various concentration camps. The ovens, the corpses, you know, the trains, everything. And uh, you can show it to these people, and they still refuse to believe it. You know, I mean, there's some 75% of Republicans, allegedly, who believe that Trump really won the election. Same mentality. That's the best I can do, but you have to corner some of these psychologists and pump them. <laughs> Anybody else? What were your parents' names? What were your parents' names? My father is Bernard and my mother is Berta. 
And um, as I said, my Hebrew name is Mordecai. Uh, and on my uh, Polish papers, I appear as Marcus. Okay. Yes, sir. Ma'am, sorry. Um, during the war itself, Canada was very anti-immigration and unwelcoming to Jews. Had that changed significantly enough by 1953 that your family felt welcome here? I think so. Um, I think so. I mean, I, I um, it was important to have a sponsor. My parents got a sponsor. But I don't remember anything beyond that as being a hurdle. Um, you know, I think that um, I think Canada did well overall. We've got a lot of people who have contributed, a lot of Jewish people who have contributed overall to our society. If you think about the Holocaust and you have six million Jews killed, and for that matter, 35 million people died as a result of World War II, the majority being soldiers, whether Japanese soldiers, American soldiers, German soldiers. And that's largely the population of Canada. So when you think of all those people that were killed because of the war, and the people who would have found a cure for cancer, or for any other debilitating disease, who are dead. Because rest assured, there were people who would have been able to find those remedies, just because the odds are that they would have. So we lost a lot because of crazy men, whether it was Hitler, whether it was Tojo, whether it was Mussolini, you know, um, society lost significant, integral pillars of society. Yes? Um, you said your father um, had a family of eight siblings? He what? had seven. It was eight. He was the youngest of eight. Okay. What happened to the others? One was shot by the uh, Poles. He was uh, liberating some uh, vegetables in somebody's garden at night. And his uh, son, it's going to be an uncle of mine, and his son, who was with him, were both shot. Uh, my grandfather, my father's father, probably died of a broken heart because his farm, and particularly his horses, were everything. And when the Germans came, they took all that, as did some neighbors who took part in the looting. Um, he just died of a broken heart. I might add something. Uh, I didn't mean to skip. But when... Uh, when the Germans came through, they initially came to the farm and took, you know, a lot of the food that they had. They took out their horses and wagons. They took a lot of uh, um, goods. They then told the Polish police that there was this Jew there and you should go and clean him out. So they went. The neighbors... It was a free-for-all. They went in there, they took whatever was left, including bedding. There was absolutely nothing left in that house because of the looting by neighbors. These are people that he lived with, my father lived with, grew up with. Uh, however, at one point, uh, as uh, there was a discussion with the local mayor about how to distribute all this stuff to the Gentile looters, Several of them stood up and beseeched their neighbors to realize what they were doing. And they gave examples of how my father saved their communities from the Russians. And I, in the memoir, I talk about uh, how my father refused to spill the beans on people who were opposed to the Russians that were in the air, that were hiding in the area and uh, how he helped them escape. And so when, the, uh, when it came to distribute this stuff, uh, the, uh, these men stood up and one of them was crying and saying, look what you're doing, you're, you're, you're hurting people who 
have done nothing but good for our community. And that was part of the mentality that encouraged them to, in fact, help my father and his family by selling food. That was, it was illegal to do that to, uh, to Jews. Mark, we have a question from one of our online participants, and I do want to remind everyone who's joining us online um, that you can ask questions in the question and answer feature, and we will um, read those aloud. So the first question that we have here is, have you ever gone back to where your parents lived during the war? Almost. Um, was it four or five years ago we were in Poland? We went to Poland um, with that in mind to a large extent because my mother's family also came from Poland, but they were in Canada before the war, so they escaped that. When we got there with the intent to go to Maidan Pinyanski, at that time Maidan Pinyanski and still today uh, is in the Ukraine. And there had been some difficulties uh, with um, sort of banded activity, maybe banded is too strong a word, but there, there had been a number of guides that were sh killed by Ukrainians. Uh, these are guides who would bring Jewish people to um, see where their parents or grandparents had come from. And so the guides that we had were nervous about that. But also, I had researched Maidan Pinyansky um, on Google, and all I saw was forest. And I, I, I knew from my father telling me, because my father after the war would send packages to people, packages of clothing and, and items to people uh, still in that area who helped them. I knew that it had been taken over by the Ukrainians and most of the village was burned to the ground because at that time, even during the war, the Ukrainians and Poles, Ukrainian nationals who wanted their own country and Poles were constantly fighting and killing each other and robbing each other's villages and so on. So I knew that there was nothing there other than forest and knowing that there was an issue with um, difficulties to go there, it, we didn't. We decided not to go uh, further. So we ended up in, a, in an area that was just short of the border between Ukraine and Poland. We, we did a good tour of Poland overall, uh, and it was quite an experience, quite interesting, which I can talk about if anybody's interested. But anyway, we did not go, but uh, I think it would be pointless other than saying somewhere there was the village. Um, well, um, first off, thanks so much for sharing your story. Um, when we, when the exhibit opened and we had a uh, kind of opening ceremony, we had uh, Rabbi David Mentor up here, and one of the things he talked about was he was kind of playing with this idea and thinking through like what is the value of history and what should we do with it. So I thought it would be interesting to pose that question to you a little bit, and maybe in two parts. One is what motivates you to kind of to tell these stories today, and second of all, what do you hope what do you hope to do we do the people do with these stories when they hear them? Well, what motivates me is uh, my parents. I mean, you know, um, these thumbnail sketches and simply saying this is what they did uh, doesn't come anywhere near appreciating the sacrifice they made. I mean, Think about being a rabbit in the woods. Jews in the woods that were running around trying to escape from the Germans had less of a chance of surviving than a rabbit in the woods. And every day you did not know if you were going to be killed. You did not know if you were going to be found out um, by looters or by uh, Germans. Uh, people that you loved were killed, men, women, children. And the intensity of that experience is something that you have to cherish, you have to recognize, you can't just ignore it. It was 
heroic in many ways. And uh, I would not, I would be doing a disservice to my parents, you know, if I ignored it. I don't like talking about it, but I mean, and what, what, what do I hope to be, to accomplish by it? Well, what do you just, I guess, what do you hope these stories will do? Like once you tell a story, it's like not yours anymore, it's everybody's, right? So. Well, uh, hopefully some people will actually think about these things because, frankly, I see parallels all the time. You know, I see parallels when 75% of Republicans think Trump won the election. What does that tell me? There are a lot of gullible people out there, gullible and stupid or simply stupid or refusing to accept reality. You know, we think we live in a democratic society. We do in Canada, largely. There are always... Um, there's always the lunatic fringe everywhere, but I mean, most Canadians are decent people. Most Canadians um, would enter, wouldn't enter their kids to do what the Germans did. That's one, one reason why they were successful in doing it, because no, the Jews didn't think that, you know, that they were being shipped to the concentration camps where they would be gassed to death or, you know, sent up in furnaces. Um, because that didn't enter the concept of civilized behavior. It can happen. It happened in Yugoslavia. It happened in Rwanda. It's happening now. There's a genocide right now as we speak. So I hope people think about these things. I can't help it but think about them. Uh, it's just It just pops into my head. And, uh, you know, if people think about it and they talk about it, maybe they can actually do something about it. I, I gotta tell you, I mean, um, I've often run across people who uh, come from Germany or the uh, some of the Eastern Slavic countries who, uh, you know, uh, just because I'm, I'm a Jew and I don't hide it, uh, are scornful of me. W what are they thinking? Like, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm not human? Like, what does it mean? So I am sensitive enough about that. Um, and that's another issue in terms of the impact of my parents' experience on me and my sister. Uh, there have been books written about them. I've got one here now. It's called Children of the Holocaust by someone called Helen Epstein. It's printed in 1979. There is a lengthy bibliography of studies that have been done on the impact of uh, Holocaust survivors' um, experiences on children. And, you know, uh, there, there's a consequence there. So the more people think about these things, the more they can understand the reality of what this kind of um, experience is. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. I hope it wasn't that boring. No one seems to be really <laughs> excited about this. asking more questions. I think we might be in awe. Yeah. Okay. Well, 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 as a former well, litigation, yeah. lawyer, as a former litigation lawyer, I enjoyed the jousting, and no one's really <laughs> jousting. <laughs> really. But anyway, um, no, I think it's got to be told. You know. I, I was at my friend's house, one of my friends, a Gentile fellow, uh, and uh, this goes back about 20 years, and, and he's a bit of an amateur historian like I am, very amateur, and we were talking about Winston Churchill. We were in his living room, and the teenage daughter, one of his children, teenage daughter was walking by, and she was about, I don't know, 16 maybe, and she said, who's Winston Churchill? You know, I mean, I, I I couldn't comprehend that. Like, what is happening in our schools? I, I don't want to generalize. I mean, I have no idea what's happening in our schools. But clearly, somewhere along the line, there seems to be, at that point anyway, it seemed to me that th this was outrageous, that a 16-year-old kid wouldn't know who Winston Churchill was, who was one of the primary reasons why Western civilization actually survived, you know? 
Uh, so this is why I talk. Well, it's crazy to think that kids, I'm sorry? It's kids now in high school are learning 9-11 in history class. Well, which really, to most of us, doesn't really feel like that long ago. But no. kids now, are, that's in their history class. It's just like, what? That happened like not that long ago. Well, you know, with media and the misinformation that's out there, you know, with uh, white supremacists and all these other, what I call lunatics, uh, making, telling their stories or, or, or trying to uh, influence uh, people, if you don't have an understanding of what happened, and this is a truism everybody knows, if you don't know history, you're bound to, do, to repeat it. Um, and to listen to people talk about Jewish space lasers uh, or, uh, you know, um, Jewish money influencing things, why do they say it? And what are the repercussions of that? The repercussions are that someone who's gullible and not particularly well informed can believe it. And, but if you don't know that that's how Hitler sold his story by blaming the Jews for everything and uh, daily uh, putting that message forward as in the form of propaganda, you know, that uh, creates an environment where you can generate hate. Uh, earlier this afternoon, I gave a talk here to a grade 10, two, two grade 10 classes. And I gave the example of um, a German soldier who had been shot during the war, towards the end of the war. And an American medic came to him and he's lying wounded there. The American medic says, Take it easy, buddy. You're going to live. We're going to transfuse some blood into you, and you're going to be okay. So the soldier said, well, is it, going to, is it Jewish blood? And the medic said, I don't know. Could be. And the soldier said, I don't want it. I don't want it. And he died. That's a true story. And you ask yourself, well, how can you have that degree of hatred Inculcated in you. How, how do you get around this, to be so uh, firm in your mindset about a, a certain people that you won't save your own life? That's what I'm afraid of. I don't think it's going to happen in the US. I don't think it's going to happen in Canada. We are too much of a of Democrat, too much Democratic in our societal makeup, and we have too many people who are, in the U.S., certainly uh, admirals, generals, uh, you know, the four-star general of the Air United States Air Force who was a Jew, go find. I mean, you know, so it, it's not the same thing, but it does trigger some lunatics to do violent things. So it has, it has impact. The propaganda has impact, and that bothers me that we don't do enough to really put these people behind bars for spreading that kind of hatred. But then there's free speech, so-called. Mm -hmm. Mark, we have a couple other uh, comments from uh, our online guests. Um, one from uh, Deborah Gold who says, thank you, thank you for the fascinating talk. And then uh, another one that says, uh, my father was a Holocaust survivor. I grew up hearing many stories about his life. He was a compassionate humanitarian who became very angry at racist stupidity. Thank you for the stories. Did you send documentation to Yad Vashem? I think I'm saying that right. Yad Vashem. And it says, uh, follows on, I have, I have so much material, letters that made it out of Europe, etc. How important is adding to the record today? Very important. Very important. You can never tell the story enough or similar stories enough. And uh, there are a lot of uh, Holocaust survivors who are still alive who went through the concentration camps and are telling the story, and certainly much more eloquently than I have. Uh, 
Is your story documented? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry, is it documented at Yad Vashem? Like what other? Uh, yes, yes, they they have the they have the memoir, and in fact, uh, one of my relatives in Israel had it translated into Hebrew, so it's it's out there. And, uh, the sad part is that uh, my father's not here to see it. Yes. Can your memoir be uploaded to some website? I, I'm a techno trick myself, but I'm sure there are people in the room who would have access to a website. Would they have your permission to upload it so it could be more accessible? The answer is yes. Uh, I am the exact opposite of you because I know how to turn a computer on. <laughs> it stops there. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's just another one of many stories. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of actually Jewish partisans who worked with the Russians behind the German lines, uh, who were armed and did a lot of damage, blew up uh, railroad tracks, blew up bridges. Their story hasn't been told enough, you know. Uh, anyway, thank you uh, for your attention. I hope that. Uh, it was worthwhile coming visit tonight, and uh, I'll pack up my stuff. And... Well, thank you so much, Mark, for sharing your stories from your family and yourself. We're so fortunate and honored. Um, to hear your words, your stories, and uh, we're grateful um, to you for um, for going through what was probably emotionally uh, and traumatic um, to share all that with us tonight. So again, very grateful for that, and I think we're all wiser and more knowledgeable. And, uh, this is such a wonderful thing. Um, so we would like to uh, I would like to um, do some closing remarks, and I would love to talk about and acknowledge the museum's partnership with the Thunder Bay Public Library. Well, we do have the exhibit downstairs uh, that, um, that is in our galleries on um, traveling here from the Montreal Holocaust Museum. The Thunder Bay Public Library put together a group um, and created some special collections of books at each of their libraries at, at locations for, um, for papers who want to explore the topic further. So I encourage you, we have some um, information down in the gallery, I encourage you to pick up the flyers and go visit the library um, to explore more in depth into the Holocaust. Um, so uh, some uh, additional programs I wanted to mention. The Thunder Bay Museum is partnering with Professor Sally um, Pelagamont of and the Ontario Dialect Project. Do look that up online. Uh, it's from the University of Toronto uh, Department of Linguistics and they're conducting oral history interviews this summer from July 13th to July 16th uh, and in here in Thunder Bay. Uh, Thunder Bay Museum invites anyone who grew up and lives in Thunder Bay in Northwest Ontario to participate in the project. Uh, we also have an internal long-term ongoing oral history project that Thunder Bay Museum is conducting and we are seeking participants from equity-seeking communities. So if you are interested in either of these projects, uh, please email the Thunder Bay Museum's Collections Curator, Sarah Silvestri, at collections at thunderbaymuseum.com. Uh, I would like to thank the Sharae uh, Shomayim congregation for both their financial and intellectual support of Thunder Bay Museum's programs. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, for the loan of artifacts, Dr. Gary Polanski, Dr. Deborah Sharp, and we would also like to thank those from the community who helped plan all of the events um, around the end of 1948 exhibit, including Dr. Daniel Hannah, Dr. Charles Book, Dr. Deborah Sharp, and Mitch Goldenberg. I'd also like to thank the museum staff and volunteers for all their hard work on the exhibit and the programming that will be enjoyed this evening. So thank you, merci, and shame a pleasure.